Who the Wild Things Are with Ryan McGuire. You gotta listen to your body. Oh my God, maybe, you know, I could get out there. I could do this. Let's take a ride. Find your wild side. Real stories. See with your own eyes. It's so beautiful. I'm gonna have the best time out here. Yeah, I was in tears. I was just like, that's the best, man. Welcome back to Who the Wild Things Are. My name is Ryan McGuire, and I'm here to bring you conversations with the most wild folks on the planet. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you enjoy the episode, share it with a friend. Appreciate you guys. Let's get it going. What's going on, guys? Today's episode is brought to you by the fine folks at Blokes. Blokes is a men's health company that specializes in hormone health, weight loss, sexual health, longevity, all those sorts of things where you feel like something might be a little bit off, Blokes is here to help. They provide labs and blood work. They can help you test your testosterone levels or different biomarkers so that you can be at your best and show up as the ultimate version of yourself. They provide one-on-one health coaching and the ability to meet with a board-certified doctor in order to correct those things that might be going wrong in your body. If you want to get some blood work done, get your labs done, go ahead and go to blokes.co or check the show notes for more info. Once again, that's blokes.co. Also, get blokes on Instagram. Thank you guys so much. Let's do the show. Good. All right, Ultra Nanny, Chris Roglowski in the building. Um, first time, I don't know if you know this, first time, three time guest oh, really? on Who the Wild Things Are. Yeah, we okay. got a lot of two timers. Yeah. You're the first three timer. I was thinking about that. I was like, I, because it was last year right after High Rocks was the first time. Yeah. And, Over a year ago. January. And then in the studio once, and then this number three. Back so for more. That's, you might get a medal for that. All right. Yeah. So. All about those medals. <laughs> <That's, Not. laughs> that we know. Um, so you got a lot going on right now. Um, I think a, a place that we could start was kind of this most recent 100 miler you did, the uh, High Lonesome 100, which I got to be a part of and experience for the first time. And uh, just kind of walk me through what went into deciding on a race like High Lonesome? Um, Well, since moving to Colorado, I had never really done any ultras in Colorado before moving here. And especially now that it's like home, I'm like, I want to do them all. Um, I did Leadville last year and loved it. It was my favorite 100 that I did last year. Um, And then it was, it was kind of a combined, I didn't make the Leadville lottery and the High Lonesome lottery opened up at Mm. about the same time. And I was like, well, I can't do Leadville. I love hundreds in Colorado, so I was like, High Lonesome it is. Um, it also worked out, Ultra is a big sponsor of High Lonesome, and they work with them, so they actually like wanted me to race it and helped with um, with all of that. So running back, how how is it that someone that does really good in Leadville doesn't get in? Why, why wouldn't they want someone like you to come back? It's entirely lottery-based. Oh. Um, well, okay, there's two ways. It's entirely lottery-based, um, random lottery draw. Um, the way I got in last year was through qualifying. So there are options to qualify in. Okay. Um, last year, I had qualified at the end of the previous year because mm. I really wanted to run it. And so I qualified through a race. They have three or four qualifiers. Um, so I qualified in. And then there was still that option for this year I technically could have. They have like a Leadville Marathon I think I could have qualified with or I could have qualified in with. And then also the 50 miler. Um, but just looking at different races I actually kind of put them on the calendar thinking I might do it anyways but I was I'm also one of a I'm kind of a like one and done like once I do it done on to the next one so how do you handle that scheduling with like the the calendar how do you because you race more than just in terms of diversity you do more diversity in racing than nearly anyone I know how do you handle like one finding out about the events and then two deciding what weekends are going to be dedicated to which thing Um, I don't know that I really have a science to it. I definitely, I guess I kind of, as soon as I hear about the races, I'm always kind of keeping tabs. As soon as I hear about races, I 
it's very basic. I keep like a note in my phone that has all the weekends of the year and mm -hmm. then races that I'm either like signed up for, considering. And then as I start going through the year, I start like, okay, I'm definitely doing this one. I need to get travel for this one. And I kind of, so I just kind of work through the year that way. Um, it worked well for me last year to kind of keep everything lined up like, when they announced the Spartan Race Series, I put all those races in. When they announced mm. Savage Race, I put all those in. And then as, you know, as I all the races for the next year kind of finalize, I decide which ones will take priority. So those kind um, of come out at like the beginning or the end of the year? What's Right. Okay. Somewhere December, January is kind of when a lot of the, yeah, I, pretty, I can get a pretty good idea of what I'm doing for the year. And then December, you just January, kind of, February. you kind of list those out. And then as the year progresses, depending on what you want to focus on, you prioritize certain races. Yeah. Well, I don't really focus on anything. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, depending on like, I mean, I mean, for uh, Spartan series, like, I definitely I have to be at these races. For Savage series, I have to be at these ones. But I also try to see like, well, can I fit multiple things in, and yeah. what kind of fights can I work for this? So I kind of put everything down, and then as it goes, like, okay, this is definitely the one that I need to, I guess, focus on. So. So you kind of arrive at you know getting into this high lonesome thing partly because of uh, Ultra, you were saying. Mm -hmm. What was the training leading up to, to Ultra? What did that look like? Or to the 100-mile high lonesome? Um, I don't – I've done – this high lonesome was my 15th 100-miler. Wow. I wouldn't say I've ever specifically trained for a 100-miler except for my very first one. My very first one, I had a lot of, I don't know if I can do this. I need to make sure – I don't know. There, there's just no idea that I could – um, so I did a lot of running leading up to it. Like specifically, I need to run longer, yeah. slower miles to get ready for this hundred. And I did a 30 mile run and that was like, I then felt like I was ready for a hundred ever since then. I, I, there's kind of this thing, like I know I can complete a hundred. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't say I really train a whole lot. Um, also I don't, I don't. I, I haven't put a lot of effort into being competitive in ultras yet, I would say. So I know I can complete them. Yeah. And honestly, half the time completing an ultra is being competitive in it. And so I kind of roll into them knowing that I can complete it and I will. Um, but I wouldn't say I have a specific training like I need to hit this certain mileage. I need to hit any kind of paces or like there's none of that. I would say just training in general. I, I don't really say I train I work out like it's a part of my lifestyle it's a part of my routine I work out every day because I am somebody who works out and I want to be fit so mm -hmm. I'm never actually training for specific things but I would say just as a part of my regular weekly daily weekly routine um if I stay consistent in my workout running schedule I know that I can run a 100 miler kind of on any given weekend and so having that pedigree of never failing on a hundred miler never having a dnf do you think if you were to like be like i'm going to be really competitive in hundreds and like try to push your pace to the absolute max do you think that chance starts to increase of not finishing races yes and no um i would say for high lonesome i definitely push the pace a lot mm. on the first half yeah um i was running well and wanted to run well so for the first 40 miles I was running pretty competitively. Mm. And it's one of those things like, yes, your chances of DNFing kind of goes up, but I think it's still more of a mental thing because yeah. if you run well, even for the first 40 miles, you can walk it in and finish. Sure. You know, if everything crashes and burns, you can walk it in and finish. And I think a lot of people at the top end realize this is not my day. I'm not going to do well. And they pull out. Yeah. But I am more of the... Like, I'm here to run 100 miles. I would like to be competitive. But at once I hit at 40 miles, I kind of, like, shut down. I just had a – my body was getting tired. My mm. legs were getting tired. I was just having a hard time. So I struggled for a bit from 40 to 50, 40 to 50 miles. Um, 50 to 70, it picked up again. I felt mm. good again for another 20 miles. Um, so I would say, um, yes, the – I, I would say the option for DNFing with a good conscience mm -hmm. goes up the more competitive you get. Yeah. The actual, like, that's what happens, that's what's going to happen, absolutely not. Like, you can still, especially if you're running good for the first 40 miles, sure. like, you don't even have to chase cutoffs and you can chill going in. Yeah. Um, it was interesting with the high lonesome because we got kind of into the 50-mile aid station 
and you were running super strong and maybe into mile 40 you were in like fourth place and then we could see that like somebody had passed you and all of a sudden we're like oh no is she gonna be messed up when she comes in and you're like no i'm just tired and then right when we left 50 i don't know something changed and you were like fine again and just like well i'll tell you what happened i took some <laughs> ibuprofen and uh caffeine yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah, and also, I mean, just seeing I that forty to fifty, I start. It's it's one of the. It's an interesting thing because I started feeling bad, and then there were no people. Mm. Um, there was just like I was just alone out there, and like it's one of those. Physically, I felt bad, and then mentally, I also bonked, and so those ten miles were just kind of a struggle. I was like. Okay, I'm moving, but I really don't feel like running, and none of this feels good. Also, like, it was beautiful views. I was enjoying the views. Like, I would say, like, I didn't – it's not like I hit a wall or, you know, felt like I couldn't continue, but I was just like, this is a rough spot, and I need to, like, get through this. And that, the sooner I get through it, the better. <laughs> is that part of, like, the, the race, you think? Like, it's just ironic that you had that, like, lonely 10 miles. You came in, and you're like, I haven't seen a human in so long, <laughs> and the race is called – Hi, Lonesome. Hi, Lonesome. That's actually a good point. I oh, like, hadn't really thought about that. I'm not really sure why it's called Hi, Lonesome. Now you know. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> no, I'm I just, high and all alone. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting that, that that was the experience and also what the name is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, For sure. But yeah, after that, I feel like um, when you got in there, we just started, you know, Jabber John and, and crew just cruising down the road yeah, and everything I, picked up. I had a great time from 50 through 70. And it's interesting, too, because I think seeing people, seeing crew, getting food and energy that I needed, like that helped a lot, um, especially knowing that a lot of people dropped before, I think, at like the um, 63-ish mile aid station Yeah, was where, because you climbed up a big climb and then ran along the CDT for a bit. Mm -hmm. And that killed a lot of people and i didn't notice it at all i had a great time i was enjoying the stars you like, started running you along like, the top of the cdt yeah, yeah i was fast. feeling great um and that's it's interesting though because if i were in the headspace i was at at 40 mm -hmm. miles i probably would have had a much harder time with that but i was like in a good headspace and my body kind of reflected that i guess yeah, but your conversation didn't because you were like, "Hey, do you want to hear about uh, stories where girls get their arms cut off?" And I'm like, uh, "I don't, I don't know. We're in the dark woods right now. I don't really know." If I, I like to talk, and I, uh, yeah, I go from, I guess I, um, yeah, I the things that I find interesting are like running, my job, and murder podcasts. Those are kind of <laughs> those are the easy things to talk about on a yeah. long run. So yeah, that's where the conversation goes. The the sur the survivor ones though. Yes, the survivor. Strictly ones. the ones where the person is about to get murdered, but then they survive. But they survive. Yeah, it's like I mean, it's yeah, they're great. They're not okay. They're not great stories, but it's very, um, it's very I guess like sobering, but also like it's a good ending. So yeah, there's something to it. There's something to it, but when you're in the woods, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I like listening to I this like right it. now. It makes it feel like a little more alive, I think. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> psycho. So, so I actually didn't get to see. You know, we got to seventy. Right as we got to seventy, I fell and ate shit. That was dope. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, you parted ways. You stopped for like thirty seconds and bounced. Tell me about seventy to uh, kind of that next aid station. Yeah. I felt good up until the next aid station. Um, this was actually, it was a portion of the course that I had run before on okay. a um, group run that they did out there. Um, so I was kind of like, I, I knew that section. I kind of knew what I was doing there. Um, and I, f I was looking forward to it because it was a bunch of downhill. The downhill definitely felt a lot different at 70 than I was kind of hoping it would. Um, mm. I normally love downhill, but this was very steep rocky like technical downhill um but i felt good for that ran into the next aid station um which is at mile 76 77 ish somewhere i don't know somewhere between seven to ten miles um and i felt good going into that ate some food was ready to go right after that was a very steep climb mm. and it was at i don't know what i really call it but i would say the hours like somewhere between like three to four to five to six a.m. where it's like almost morning but it's not quite and it's kind of this weird thing of you're ready for the night to be over and mm -hmm. for it to be light again 
also knowing that it's going to get hot and sunny and you don't want it to be light. And so it's mm. almost this weird in between of like, I don't want the night to end or I'm so ready for the night to end. I don't want it to end. And at the same time, you're just like, it's been the night for so long. The excitement's worn off. Yeah. And it's just a weird time. And I, that's a time that I've kind of historically always struggled with. Mm-hmm. Um, and hitting a big climb there. And I was getting to a point, I started feeling it, I guess, probably at like 60, 70 miles. It definitely, on the downhill, it felt fine. But when I hit that climb, um, my lungs were having a very hard time. I was Mm. having a hard time breathing. And it got to where that climb felt awful. Um, It was just hard to move uphill because you're, you know, automatically your breathing picks up. And I was like, my lungs were just feeling terrible. I was coughing and wheezing and like, yeah, I don't know what it is with my lungs. I'm not sure if it's like exercise induced asthma or if it's just the dust and the cold and exhaustion, whatever. Um, But yeah, that's where that kind of set in. And then I feel like from there pretty much to the finish, all of the uphills felt like I was crawling Mm -hmm. I kind of was probably going at a crawling pace um it just didn't feel good it felt awful and I kind of struggled there was another guy that had uh the exact same thing that when I left you he I went to sit by the fire yeah and he had dropped and we were talking at 50 because he was having lung issues he like doesn't usually use an inhaler but they gave him an inhaler and it like worked for a second and then didn't so Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that course like all that kind of chalky gravel if people were just like breathing that in for sure there's that like moon dust is what i call it where it's that yeah. really soft fine clay dirt yeah. um my thing is though, i've had it at other hundreds mm. i i had it more when i was living in texas and going from like zero elevation to the mountains it would hit really bad um let i feel like by the time i finish any hundred i kind of have like a i don't know an ultra lung is what it's kind of called where i'm kind of like wheezing and coughing some but it definitely, I think the combination of the dirt plus the high elevation, um, it definitely hits in a slightly different way. Yeah. So then you kind of power through that and looked like you had a, a special finish with I, uh, your nanny fam. Yeah. It was pretty great. This was, so the family that I work for lives here in Denver. And when I told them I was doing this one locally, I was in Buena Vista. They were like, well, my kid's mom the kids I named their mom um she started running and she was all excited about she I told her I was like just run for 20 minutes walk as needed but like run for 20 minutes and she's gotten to where I think she's she ran 2.3 miles and like felt good so she was all like I want to come and pace you and I was like that would be great like as she first she was like you'll probably be running too fast I was like no by the end of 100 miles I will be running I will be walking probably like that would be awesome if you would come and pace me um she's now 20 weeks pregnant and so she was like kind of out on the pacing but her husband my the kid's dad came out and he ran with me for 10 miles we spent most of that 10 miles telling scout and crosby stories nice. um yeah the two little kids i nanny they are yeah it's they've there's a lot of funny things that they do and say so it's great it was really fun to talk with I tell all my friends about it and all my friends, like they're funny stories, but to actually talk with somebody that knows them. uh, Yeah, it was great. So he ran with me for 10 miles. And then once we hit the road, um, they were pulled up there in the car. They had made a sign said like, run, Chris, run. It was great to like see all of them. This was like three miles out from the finish. And then she walked and ran with me for about a mile and a half. And then, um, yeah, at the finish line, I tried to like, I told the kids, I was like, you can run in with me. And they were like, no, not about it. But um, yeah, it was, I think one of the cutest things was um, after I'd finished, I was like standing there, you know, I'd sat down, I'd take my pack off, I was kind of eating, whatever. And this other guy came running through. And of course, there's not a whole lot of people because it's like all the finishes are very spread out. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, there's people that know the runner. And other than that, there's maybe, you know, 10, 20 people. So I told Scout, the little four-year-old, I was like, hey, like, let's clap. He's coming in. Like, great job. And she kind of looked at me and she was like, but you already did it faster than him. And I was like, (laughs) yes, yes, I did. But like, we're still proud of him. Um, And then she told her mom, she was like, I can't believe Chris won that, is what she said. And then a couple days later, even, you know, later that week, she told me, Miss Chris, I can't believe you won that. And I was like, I just kind of, I just thought, I was like, that's crazy, isn't it? And she like crossed her arms. And she goes, I think it's really neat. And I was like, me too. Wow. <laughs> me too. It was really cute because they have no concept, but like just seeing me run across the finish line, they're like, Chris is so fast. Chris won. I'm like, yep, <laughs> those things. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, it was really fun. Yeah. I wonder what kind of impact 
growing up with you as a nanny is going to have. Like, if these kids are just going to be, like, little Goggins growing up, like, just super into the running scene or, like, I don't know what that early exposure does to kids. I'm not sure. And I would say it's not really, like, full exposure because I do, like, I run and work out before I Mm. come to hang out with them. I would say, though, like, a lot of times we'll go for runs. Like, if we're going to go to a park, I'll kind of pick a further park that I can run to. Or if we're going to their grandma's house that's two and a half miles away, like, we'll get in the stroller and run over there. Um, So it's like a part of their culture. I don't think they really understand the extent of it. So Mm. I'm not sure what kind of an impact it will have. Um, One thing that I love, though, is I like to take them out. Like, I... I've been finding little creeks and little play areas like kind of up in the foothills that I can take them to. And they love playing outside. They love playing in the water. Um, And there was one morning I asked Scout when I woke up, I was like, hey, like, what do you want to do today? And she asked me, can we go to the mountains again? And I was like, that's my girl. Um, But I I would say, I mean, their parents um, are also like active and Mm. spend a lot of time in the mountains up in Vail, skiing, all those kind of things. So it's definitely like already part of their culture. And I don't know that my extremeness really like filters through to them a whole lot. I've told her several times, like, I'm going to run 100 miles. And like, she knows that's a lot, but she has no concept of what that actually is. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't think they really get it. I feel like most um, adults don't really have a concept of what that, that is. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. It's like so every adult's just like, I don't even like to drive my car 100 miles. That is the classic response. It's like, can you get a new like <laughs> saying? Yeah. Because I've already heard yeah, that yeah. one. We've heard that a few times, a lot of times. So after this uh, high loan sum, you didn't get your endurance cup filled all the way. You decided to do a crazy ass triathlon the following week. What did the period look like in between those two? Um, I always say when I run an ultra, it like the high from finishing an ultra lasts like a week or two. Mm. And it is kind of my favorite thing because I love running it. Like I love the actual running 100 miles um just all the different things that it brings you through and then the finish is great i love the finish um i always like to hike a peak the day after so the day after high lonesome i went and did a 14er um casual just i i like to be in the mountains and that's like it's one of those things too like um i feel like your body is kind of trying to say like hey we're tired out we're exhausted and it's true like yes you did a lot it's tired out but I kind of have this thing where I don't like to like give into that and like sit in that. I don't like to encourage just sitting and mm-hmm. I guess almost like feeling pain and like discomfort. So my thing is like, yes, like we just ran a hundred miles, but it finished Saturday morning. We had the whole day Saturday to recover Saturday night. Sunday is still another day of the weekend and I do not want to waste a day on Sunday. Um, and I know that mentally I love being at the top of a mountain. So it's one of those things where like I tell myself, this is good for me. It's shaking my legs out. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, I think of it as like reminding my body, like, yes, you're tired and you did a lot, but you're still fine. Like just what get out there and do something. did you finish? Um, 1130, I think. On Saturday. Saturday morning. And yeah. then you just like kind of eat, crash. Yeah. Wake up the next morning and you're up on the mountain. Yep. Oh. No, I'm on the mountain. And it's to me it's very much it's a reminder that like yes, everything hurts, but you're actually just fine. And mm. I found it's the best recovery for my body. Um uh, my Achilles, I have a tight Achilles that I've been kind of feeling for a while now. And it was it feels good when it's like warmed up and moving. So during the whole hundred miles, didn't feel anything, but right after it tightens up a lot. And getting out the next day and yep. going and hiking, it like hurt initially i do a lot of leg scraping and working with it it hurt initially but getting out there again like it warmed it up and it was less stress than 100 miles so that kind of like helped that issue um yeah so 14 to the next day um i think i took monday mostly off i chose to not go to the gym Mm -hmm. um normally i like to get right back into it run work out monday through thursday on a on a regular basis Um, But I chose not to. I think I took Monday off, and then I ran Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, Different, I think Tuesday, I just ran uh, my basic, like, seven miles that has slight elevation. Um, Wednesday, I went out and um, hit a trail with a lot more elevation um, to get, you know, out on the trails and up higher. Um, And then Thursday, oh, and I was planning to swim, couldn't swim. Uh, Thursday I did a little bike run bike, um, Mm. because 
Friday I was taking in, well I ran Friday morning before heading out to Utah um, so yeah Friday was mostly day off and then Saturday we're ready to roll did you have to get a lot of because I know you're kind of new to the triathlon stuff did you have to get like a new fancy bike and swim gear or are you just like rocking a huffy so a little of both I would say okay. um I definitely lucked out for so I've done I did an Ironman basically exactly one month before this one and I borrowed a bike, my friend's dad's bike. Okay. And um, so I've definitely lucked out with being able to borrow bikes, the bike specifically. Um, everything else, I start thinking about it, like what I'll need a week or two before, and I pretty much get things off of Amazon. Yeah. So for the first one, everything I've gotten is like between 20 to $40 off of Amazon. Sure. So my wetsuit that I got for the first one, I like ordered it off of Amazon and it, it worked fine. It's nothing fancy. I don't think it's actually like affecting my performance really at all and it works fine i got a little tri suit i was like i need because i don't when i bike here i don't like the biker shorts they're very uncomfortable to me but i was like if i'm biking 100 miles i should have some bike shorts um so i ordered like a little tri suit and then i for this one um i actually borrowed a friend of mine from the gym is like a professional cyclist and his wife had an extra bike and mm. he was like you can borrow it because the bike that i borrowed for the first one was not fitted to me it was very big apparently i didn't really know the difference but um so he actually brought this bike over and fitted it to me so adjusted everything to where it's like i'm in the ideal position for that um but i had to get shoes for that bike for those pedals for that bike um i trying to think what else i got i bought a helmet for 25 bucks from you know, the local sports store. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. I don't, I don't have a fancy tri suit. I don't really. What? I don't even really know. What, is a tri the, suit like the thing that you're swimming and biking in? Yeah, it's like a, a one piece. Yeah. And I think the difference with a well, yeah, it's a tri suit. It's like a one piece, but it has a shirt, like a bike shirt, and a lot of these bike shirts will have pockets in the back that you right. can put food and stuff in. Um, but it unzips all the way. Yeah. So then I guess ideal or the thought is on the run, you can kind of like unzip it and just wear the shorts, like the under suit. Because um, you typically want more. You want like sleeves and a shirt for the bike. Right. Sun protection. Wind protection. Yeah. 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 They tried um, to sell me the like that onesie suit for the 24 hour assault bike. But I felt like when I put it on, I don't know, I just felt so suction cup tight that i was like i don't want to wear this for 24 hours like yeah. that sounds terrible yeah so I, it's definitely i definitely liked i like it for the bike the one piece because you don't have like wind it's not flapping around yeah and the nice like long shorts with the padding like that's very nice um but i don't know how people wear it for the run as soon as i get to the run i'm like i need running shorts on and you just have like running shorts sports bra underneath so you can take the whole thing off and then just <laughs> I just wear like a, a sports bra and like underwear underneath yeah. and then I take all that off and shorts on. And you can yeah. just leave it at the station? Yeah. Um, this one, so this triathlon, normally- I clearly know nothing about triathlon. Yeah. So I'm like normally in transition, they actually have people like helping in transition and you can drop everything and they'll bag everything up and put it somewhere to pick up. Um, this Starvation X Tri was fully self-supported, mm. self-support, self-crewed, whatever. So you had to have your own crew, but they followed us the entire time. And so when I got out of the swim, I had my bike already, but they helped get everything off and then they cleaned up all my swim stuff and they drove to meet me at the next place. Um, and then when I came in, the bike, uh, what was it? When you, the transition, the transition to and finish line. So the transition from the bike to the run and the finish line were actually at the same place. Mm. So I was able to like get change drop off and then go out for this run. And this run was basically a big loop up and around a pass and back down into that same ski resort. So. Gotcha. Talk to me about the swim, because I know that's not necessarily like your background. It's not at all my background. <laughs> I was actually, I thought about it. On the bike, I found on triathlons, like I spend a lot of time thinking. And I was thinking about it. And I was like, I, so swim background, I took some uh, lessons at the community pool when I was like six, seven. And I just remember like just trying so hard to pass the little tests like at the end of the season. But I don't know. I think I learned like basic comfortability around water but i was not a swimmer um we moved out to texas and we to survive the texas heat for a couple summers we had this like four foot deep pool uh yeah. you know like a i don't know, like a 
what do you those pools above ground pool. above ground pool there you yeah. go a four foot deep above ground pool um and i thought i learned to swim in that but i think honestly i just learned to like crawl around underwater really well yeah um but i got more comfortable with water there so from you know like 10 11 12 i swam a lot but it was more just staying cool and spending a lot of time like holding my breath swimming around underwater but that was it um then at 17 i was i kind of had some like uh, like a traumatic water ex- water experience mm. um i was like on the scene of this accident where these children drowned and so oh. ever since then i've been very not like i don't know just very not really okay with water wow. it's just not my thing and my what i've always just kind of said is like it can kill people so fast and that's kind of that's kind of my thing i'm like i'm not I like, I love jumping off of cliffs. I will always jump off cliffs and like swim around in water. But when it comes to like spending time in water, I kind of panic, like putting my head underwater and trying to breathe. And like, I just don't like the feeling of not being able to breathe constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't until probably um, a couple years later, I did, it was always, well, I, triathlon has always kind of interested me because I, I'm not even really sure why. I think my older brother did one when I was like a teenager and I was like, that looks cool and hard. Um, So I did my first, I did a sprint triathlon, I think when I was like 20, maybe 21. And I had planned to like, I was like, okay, I'm going to like swim. I'm going to learn to swim because that's something I've always, I know I struggle with it and I'm like, I can survive in the water, but I don't know how to swim. I really just don't. Um, Like I've never actually swim I guess um so I had planned to swim leading up to the sprint triathlon and did nothing so turn up to the sprint triathlon and it's an open water swim it's only I think like 750 meters but I remember just like you know there was it was a triangle so you swim out to one buoy you swim over to the other buoy and then you swim back to the shore and I looked at that first buoy and I was like that's a long ways away and I was like all right well I gotta get to it and so you know just kind of made my way through the water I wouldn't really call it swimming like you know, but I made it to the first buoy, took a little breath, made it to the next buoy, got out, done. Um, and then that was kind of the f- a couple years later, I was going to do a Olympic triathlon with some friends. And I had a friend in Texas that was doing half Ironmans mm-hmm. and she would go swimming at this lake. And she actually took me out swimming once and we like I wore the whole wetsuit and with the little buoy. And she gave me a couple pointers on swimming, but. Again, I still had no idea what I was doing. Um, and it's something that I, I've always, I feel like I should be better at. I have really large hands and really large feet. Like I should be a good swimmer. But there's there's kind of this tension between like, I, do, I just don't like the water. I yeah. don't want to spend time in it. I don't like it at all. Um, so anyways, that, so I spent some time swimming a couple swimmers ago, um, kind of getting ready for this um olympic distance they ended up canceling the swim because the river was too high or something so i didn't swim for that but that fall i signed up for a half ironman i was like here we go um it was supposed to be a downriver swim i was like this will be great i can float downriver you know um but it turns out that day it was windy really bad upstream and there were like waves going upstream whoa as soon as i got in the water i kind of panicked and i couldn't put every every time i put my head underwater i was immediately like i can't breathe So I literally just kind of like doggy paddled and kind of like, so I'm keeping my head above water. I went like out to the far side and they have in these Ironmans, they have um, like kayaks and paddle boards every very close together. So for the first half mile, I was like, I would try to put my head underwater and I was like, I kind of practiced this and I just couldn't. So for the first half mile, I kind of like scrambled through it, would rest on the kayaks, catch my breath, keep going. And then finally it was the second half mile I calmed down enough to not need to grab onto the kayaks as much. Still had a hard time putting my head under water, but was like, I'm trying. Um, I made it out of that swim. I think it took me an hour and eight minutes, or an hour and three minutes. And I think you had an hour and 10 was the cutoff. Whoa. So I was like cutting it close, but I was just glad to be that I'd done it, you know. Um, so that was my half Ironman. The bike, the run, had a blast. And I told myself after that, I'm good. I don't ever want to swim further than that. That was not it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think the following year, uh, somebody told me, somebody's getting ready to do their first Ironman. I was like, oh, I did a half Ironman. And they're like, half Ironman? Anything with half in front of it isn't the real deal. Like, we don't don't talk about it if you've done a half Ironman. And I was like, okay, I don't care. 
But I think it kind of sat with me a little bit where I was like, maybe I should do a full Ironman at some point. Yeah. And then come to this summer, a bunch of people from the gym were getting ready to do the Boulder Half Ironman. And I was like, okay, that Half Ironman was kind of fun. I would do it again. And then I realized, I was like, no, I've already done a half. I need to do a full. So mm-hmm. I got on the Ironman website and found the full in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and went ahead and signed up for it. Again, I planned to swim. I was like, I'm going to get better at swimming. I'm going to swim. Did zero swimming until the week before. I was like, no, I really need to swim. So I went to the pool and mm-hmm. I swam for, I think I had like 25 minutes before work. And I just swam back and forth and was like, okay. And this was the Wednesday before the race, which was on Sunday. Nice. Um, yeah. So I guess that's kind of like the lead up. That's my background in swimming. I did this, the Ironman that I did a month ago. And again, as soon as I got, well, leading up to it, I was like terrified, probably the most scared I've been before a race in a very long time. I thought I might throw up. I was like, I don't feel good. I'm scared. Um, and my biggest thing was, I don't know if I can make the cutoff for the 2.4 mile swim. For the 2.4 miles, you have two hours and 20 minutes. Okay. And I was like, I don't know if I can do it. Um, but so I, you know, they have the pace groups cause it's kind of a way to start. And I went to the very back pace group and I was talking to them and it actually made me feel a lot better talking to these guys that, you know, had paced themselves at two hours. And they were like, as long as you keep moving, you'll be fine. I've gotten out of this. Some one guy gotten out, I think at like two hours and 18 minutes. And like, I was like, okay, these are people. And there's a little bit of like, these are sort of like, these people do Ironmans a lot, but they're kind of average. And I was like, I'm an athlete. Like, I know I can get through it. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> And so it gave me a little more confidence and like, I think I can still, as soon as I hit the water again, I like panicked for the first half mile. This time I almost like, I kind of was expecting it. I was like, I know I'm going to be scared. So for the first half mile, really struggled. Couldn't really put my head in water. Also, there were a lot of people. Um, But I know some things I definitely noticed were like the, the wetsuit was very buoyant. And I was like, oh, this isn't actually bad because I thought I would probably drown out mm-hmm. there <laughs> I even told I was like if I don't come back I'm somewhere in the lake like um so yeah the the wetsuit was very buoyant um mm-hmm. it was a beautiful lake the mm-hmm. sun was coming up it was absolutely beautiful I was like could be worse um and it took me about a half mile to warm up into it and then I started being able to actually swim and stroke and I would my my goal was to try to like take 10 breaths before taking a break because I'd like take a break and you know swim above water for a little bit and that was my that was my goal for it and I ended up by the second lap all most of the swimmers were out of the water by then <laughs> and I actually had some space to like actually swim so the sec because it was a two lap of course yeah. you basically swam out in a big you anyway so that was that swim got out in like an hour 59 and it was one of the biggest feelings of accomplishment I've ever had because really? this was something that like I have a lot of like fear around it and yeah. a lot of discomfort and it's very not something I enjoy at all. Like, and that's what I decided after like swimming something. I was like, I like to breathe air. Like, I'm not a fish. Like, yeah. if I was a fish, I'd have gills. Like, this is not how I would be built. Um, but accomplishing that was huge. And it definitely carried me into the bike. Like, I flew through the bike, flew through the run. Like, I just felt so good to be done with that swim. Um, anyways, that brings to like coming up to starvation. I... Actually, Starvation's I, the name of yeah, this most recent yeah. triathlon. Starvation X try. I actually I texted <clears throat> the guy that had told me like half surfer losers. Um, and I told Suck him it, I was, nerd. <laughs> I was like, look, I did a full Iron Man, and he immediately came back with, "Cool, are you going to join us at Starvation?" And I was like, "What's that?" So I ended up looking it up, and at first I was like, "No, this looks stupid. Like I have no desire to do another one." Like, and after I finished that swim, I was like, "Done it, done." Like. I'm not an Iron Man person. Like, it's not a thing. But I looked it up. And at first, I was like, no, I'd planned to be like hiking in the mountains for that weekend. I was like, no, I'm getting lost in the mountains. I'm out. And then it came up again like a week or two later. And I looked in it and actually read all about it. And I was like, okay, this is actually really tough and really challenging. And I was like, this looks like kind of fun, like, <laughs> challenging. But there's definitely like, I've done an Iron Man. This is like on a whole different level, but it kind of looks fun. So I waited until I had to like find a crew, get a bike. And my, my friend had like said, he was excited I had biked and he was like, you can use this bike, you know? So 
I got a crew, got a bike, and I signed up on the, well, I went to sign up on the last day you could sign up, and they closed the registration already. And I, like, called and emailed them. I was like, hey, like, I wanted to sign up. I know, like, this is the last day, and it's already closed. Anyway, so they opened it up a little bit extra. Um, Yeah, so I signed up, and again, this time I actually went and did, like, an hour-long open water swim Mm. um, in a lake around here that's actually kind of gross. But (laughs) I was like, I did the open, like, I swam for an hour open water because I knew – the fact that I like fell into it by the end of that 2.4 mile swim, I was like, I can swim. I, I can do this. I just yeah. need to do it more. And then the other big thing that I did was I went and like took a lesson. My friend that used to swim, mm. I went to her gym and like swam and she was like, okay, your swim stroke, stroke like actually isn't that bad. And she gave me basically like three things where like this would help you be more efficient. Was it the, the teacher from V23? No. Cause the, I had uh, talked to her, Lindsay. Lindsay was a swimmer, right? Yes, she yeah. is a swimmer. She or, coaches swimming. Yeah. I so say, I talked to her actually before the first one and like, hey, we should swim, but just never really synced up. Yeah. This was actually, it's my friend's girlfriend who okay. I saw like swam and I was like, and he started working at a gym that had a pool. So just, it all just worked out. Anyway, she gave me like three pointers that she was kind of like, I see you doing this. Here's something you can do to change it and like do it a couple times. And I noticed such a difference. I was mm. like, oh, yeah and i'd even watched some videos on form and like i understood it but seeing her do it and then seeing having her see me do it i was like oh it makes sense so specifically let me know because i'm trying to it was i'm trying to learn right now one of the biggest things is like um rushing your strokes you're supposed to kind of keep both hands out in front one arm comes back and fully returns before the next arm does Huh. And I would do like a this one and this one, like you're kind yeah. of constantly moving. Um, that one, a lot of, I was doing a lot of crossing the body, almost like trying to get a more powerful pull. I was kind of pulling across and she was big on like, almost like over-exaggerate, keep your hands directly in front of you and you want your arm to stay on one side of your body the entire time. Otherwise, you're basically like pulling to the side as you're Wasting trying to go forward. Wasting all that energy. Yeah. And then another big one was, I forget what I was doing, but on the returns re- when you're bringing your arm back you want your fingertips to almost just barely scrape the top of the water so you're kind of keeping your elbow bent uh-huh. and you're bringing it back instead of i think i was doing kind of like a huge. big reach around i yeah. do that yeah and she her thing was she you know basically drag your fingertips along just slightly to keep that elbow bent and close to your body and super you're like, efficient yeah and yeah, those make sense yeah so those were i think those were kind of the three things that um she kind of pointed out and I noticed made a huge difference. So when I went into this next swim, A, I was like, I know, like I'd actually practice swimming underwater. I, I've struggled this thing of like, I know I don't have a good swim stroke, but I don't really know what to do about it. And I just hadn't, I don't like water. So I just avoided it. But actually putting in the time to like, okay, now I know what's what I was doing wrong and what I can do better here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the swim went well. I did it in an hour and 37, which is still not like an amazing swim, but it's 20, 22 minutes, minutes off what you did last time. Yeah. So I was very happy with that. And I felt good. Like I noticed even uh, probably, you know, halfway through, I started thinking about those cues a little bit more. And I was like, oh, noticed a difference even then. Like that's one month, 15% increase. Yeah. I, I was, I was very happy with it. Yeah. yeah. It was a smaller field, so it was one of those when I came out of the water, I was still like, am I the last one out of the water? And there was still a handful of people in there. But it was a, there was only 55-ish people that started. Oh, wow. Small yeah. race. It's an extreme race, and, like, it's not a typical Ironman, um, which there was a point later where I passed somebody, and they were like, this is not Ironman. And my thought was like, yeah, this is X try. Like, this is not. And I asked him, I was like, oh, have you done Ironman? He's like, yeah, 22 of them. I was like, Whoa. So it sounds like you're ready for something different. Like. It sounds like this is more like adventure racing. Yeah. Like, a, or yeah. at least it's adventure racing, but with the three disciplines from Ironman rather than like incorporating mountaineering or kayaking. Yeah. I don't really know where they get the name from, but it reminds me a lot of Xterra, where Xterra right. is triathlon, but they have a lot more liberty with what they can do. Like yeah. they do mountain bikes, they do trail runs. So this was one of those like, yes, it's all Ironman distances, but instead most Ironmans, there's different courses that are more difficult than others. You know, they say yeah. like Lake Placid is one of the most difficult ones. Um, you know, they have like levels of difficulty, but it's all kind of, you kind of know how it goes. This one had way more climbing than any on the bike than any other one, almost 10,000 feet of climbing Damn. over the 100 miles. Um, and then on the run, it also had another like 6,500 feet of climbing, which mm. you don't see. 65 ever. over marathon? Yeah. Yeah. And that- it was on trail. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
So those like you don't see that in an Iron Man. So yeah, I mean it's much more of like a a trek than it is a marathon. Yeah. You know, it's like a mountain trek. Yeah. And that's why I was excited about it. And yeah. It turns out like suits you. Yeah, it definitely did. I found on the bike, um, I started passing people right away. And I wasn't like I I biked this distance a couple times. So I was like what I found interesting about the last Iron Man that I did, I didn't have the gearing figured out and so I rode in one speed the entire time. And so on these uphills, there are quite a bit of uphills. I think there's like five thousand feet of gain in the first one that I did. Um and on the uphills to get up the hills, I couldn't like downshift mm. and and spin it out. I had to stand up on my pedals and pedal uphill. And I did that the whole time and I thought like my legs are going to feel this. I'm going to get tired. And I didn't really. Yeah. Because I think, I mean, there's not, it's not the impact is different than running. I can run for a very long time. So biking, like, yes, it's a lot of work for your legs, but it's also like a, like a lower grade. Yeah. Um, so I realized at that, that one, I was like, I am good at the uphills. Like, I don't like the uphills. Um, so on this one, I, we went over two passes. The first pass is a good, like nine mile climb up. I don't know how many feet of elevation gain, but it was, it was basically two big climbs, those two big passes. Um, and I would kind of alternating, alternate between sitting and standing. Yep. And I was just kind of cruising along, and I started passing a bunch of people up. I think I passed at least four or five, six people. Um, and then, so then we, I was like, okay, that felt good. And then you had a pretty, you had a really steep downhill, a lot of downhill. And then you get in the last 10 miles is the last climb, and it is – basically 10 miles uh, from 86 to 96 Mm -hmm. and it's 4,000 feet of gain. Okay. And like they talked about this guardsman pass. I didn't know it's the steepest climb in Utah or the hardest Mm. climb, the hardest pass, something like that. Like it's, it's known. Um, I don't know enough about biking to know that, but I started going and I'm like, you know, lowest gear possible biking, biking. And then I got to a point where I was like, I can't bike this. Like, and the hill keeps going up. Yeah. So I got off and started walking and I was like, this feels up. But I talked to some people before and they were talking about like, it's like a 17% grade. Mm. And when you try to pedal that, like your front, your front wheel almost comes off. Yeah. You start and slipping. I was like, I was like, so are we walking this? And they were kind of like, I kind of got the idea that like people will be walking this. So I didn't feel totally stupid for walking, but it also felt dumb to like get like my clip in shoes where I'm like, I'm a cyclist now and I am walking my bike up the hill. But you're also like, like in the front of the pack at this point. No, or, right? not quite. Oh, okay. I was probably in the middle of the pack. Okay. I was probably running 20, 20, 25 ish there. Okay. Um, just based off of who I passed. And I didn't really know. I knew I was the first girl cause there were only four girls. I feel up. like you were like 15th, but I, I could be wrong. I was going to say you're like 15. Sort of. Or... Well, I know I passed six people on that climb. So that's on that mm. climb. I got off and, and walked, but I could like see my pace. And I was like, my literal thought was like, I've hiked 4,000 feet up a 14er. Yeah. Like, I can do this. Um, and I know I can hike like a 20 minute pace, 20 minute per mile pace. Three miles so an I, hour. Yep. Three miles an hour. Yeah. And so I just tried to keep my pace at three miles an hour. And I was just like marching up this hill. Um, I started passing people and these people are all like, walking slowly and taking breaks in the shade and i was like okay at the time i thought it was like an eight mile climb i was like it's eight miles of uphill like that's doable yeah and so i was ready to just hike it out there were definitely a couple times where it would flatten out some i'd get on and pedal and i'd hit i think i hit 17 miles per hour once you know going down this little hill i was like yes um but for the majority of that 10 miles we were walking our bikes up the hill and everybody that i passed was walking i don't know if anybody biked it like unbroken yeah i think uh, what it is, you can get the gearing on your bike lower to right. where it'll go lower. My bike wouldn't, like, my bike was not geared low enough. At some point, um, I'm wondering, though, if it's because you gear so low that you start going so slow. It's is faster it to faster to power hike up it? If your bike's super light and you're just pushing a really light bike, you might yeah. go up quicker hiking. Yeah, I except know. I would say, like, for every step on your pedals, you're getting more than you are walking. So even yeah, when true. I would... I felt like I was pedaling slowly, but I would still instantly bump up to like six miles an hour. Yeah. And like, doesn't feel like I'm going much faster, but just your the wheels, like they roll. Um, turns out. Yeah. <laughs> turns out. how it goes. Wheel spin. Um, wheel. Yeah. So I passed six people on that and I noticed, I mean, that's where I started realizing I was like, this is like grit and I'm good at grit. Like I can, I can grit through stuff. Um, and so as I passed them, I'd be like, we're having fun, right? 
from having a good time that you've never walked this long this long or this far in these shoes you know i was trying to like stay lighthearted, and i started picking up like everybody else was pretty pissed and like not having a good day neither was i but i was like i'm gonna hike right past them and then i would expect them all to like go with me yeah and i'd hike for a bit and i glance back i'm like there's nowhere in sight like so i, I know i passed six people on that Came into the run transition. Because once you finally top out it, I think it's 96, you have a four-mile downhill okay. into the transition. And I came in there, and I was – that downhill was fun. And so I came in, and I was like, that was fun. And somebody said something about, like, yeah, Chris coming into transition saying that was fun. I was like, okay, yeah, Guardsman Pass was not fun. But that last little bit before the aid station was, you know. So I came into there, and, um, yeah, I knew I had passed six people. I knew I was first woman. I assume there's still a ton of people in front. Is that for you or is that for fucking with other people's heads when you're like hitting them with like the... 100% both. Yeah, okay. Absolutely both. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you're like, you're doing a little bit of those mind games, right? Like, aren't you having a good time? And you know that they're not yeah. like, it's, it's a rhetorical yeah. question. Nobody, nobody's is. having fun, but you get to control it because you are asking the question yeah. and you get to be cheery. And there's a little bit too of like, almost like I know it sucks for everybody but I think it's sucking a little less for me. Yeah. But I think that's because I choose to like, I mean, I was enjoying the views and I was I mean, not enjoying anything else. But <laughs> but I was views definitely like, yeah, I was like, but when I came up to him and realized, I guess it was almost like I was trying to like stay like positive about it and realizing they were negative. I was like kind of feeding off of that a little bit. I'm yeah. like, this sucks for everybody, but it sucks less for me, not for any reason other than that I'm just choosing to let it suck less. And yes, my legs hurt and these shoes are incredibly uncomfortable to hike up a paved road in. Yeah. But I'm not stopping and taking breaks and stretching. Like I wonder, did anyone go barefoot? Because to me, I'm I'm not wearing those biking shoes. I'm taking them off. Like to, it, to hike. If it was me, I would have rather I hike barefoot. Fully expected when I thought about it, like the night before even when I talked to people and they said they were walking. I thought about it and I was like, I would because the shoes are very uncomfortable. And I was terrible. like, I would probably like hike in socks. Yeah. I thought that, but then out there, I definitely didn't. Um, one of my shoes is definitely more uncomfortable than the other, but I was still trying to clip in and bike every once in a while. So that's it's, true. Yeah, it was too much of a hassle to take them off. You don't want to um, have to put them back on just to get to the, you know, 50 meters of biking. Exactly. Take, yeah. I was definitely, and I've never, there were several times, like, I'm, I was still trying to figure out the clip in, and there were a couple times where I pedaled, and I was like, they're not clipped in. I was like, I can still pedal just fine. Yeah. And then I get off, and one was clipped in, one wasn't. But anyways, yeah. Um, Yeah, so it's definitely both. I do it to make myself feel better, and a little bit to feed off, like, if I can sense their feeling worse i kind of feed off of that and like i'm like well this sucks and i don't feel good but at least i feel better for them and so I now you sounds a little sadistic like no, i'm feeding no, off it, of other people's negative energy but no it doesn't i mean there's something that's like competitive spirit right yeah. so you you come in to that transition point as they call it i'm assuming it's kind of like an aid station too yeah yeah and now you know like it's just i'm running. going into running which is my best thing i just saw everybody struggling a lot worse than I am. You have to feel pretty good at that point about your chances of doing pretty well. For sure. And I still didn't know where I was in the men's field, but I knew I was first. And I knew I was like, I don't think anybody else is hiking up that pass as fast as I did. Right. Um, so I set out on the run and it actually started with, I think, two miles of running downhill. And I was like, this is fantastic. I was flying. I was doing like 730 miles, like feeling great. Um, and then you get on the trail and immediately you start climbing and we climbed and climbed and i started i passed up one person almost right off the bat but then there was this guy that i was actually i kind of got out of the out of that transition with i was kind of running like i was right behind him i passed him getting onto the trail but then he passed me and i started like i was having a hard time moving almost like the uphill kind of mm -hmm. and i was like the last one i did when i got off the bike i had running legs now but I started thinking, I was like, I just hiked 10 miles up that hill. I right. was like, I'm tired of hiking already. Yep. So I'd say the first 10 miles even, um, it was a lot. Of, we were going up a lot. But when we'd hit flats, I would like tell myself I should run. And I was like, I think I'm walking quickly faster than I would be running right now. Yeah. So the first 10 miles, I was definitely like not moving very fast. And I was a little, I wasn't past, I, there was nobody really around. And I kept on thinking I heard the people behind me. I think I passed like two people 
two guys and their pacers. And I kept on thinking I heard them and I was like, they're catching up to me. Like I'm not moving fast enough because I, I knew I need to like, I don't want to get past. Yeah. And I knew I'd already passed them. So you kind of have that like, you know, it's a plus one and minus one. It kind of zeroes out if that like, you know, when you're passing. Um, like, but then that's I, like the definition of tenacity is like when you can pass someone and then hold them off. Yeah. That's like how you define tenacity. It's like, are you going to let them repass you or are you going to be able to fend them off yeah. for the rest of the race? Yeah. yeah. And it's one of those like, yeah, I always, I'm always like, well, if, if I pass them, it's a plus one for me. But if they pass me back, it's like I'm zeroed. But I definitely don't want to get past by anyone. Are you more of a person that likes to like kind of ride someone right behind them and then try and pass? Because I run better if I'm in front the whole time. I'm, I run faster wire to wire. I've just found that through races. Like my best races are when I've started hot, took the lead, and tried to hold it versus like being I've that. kind of had both. Okay. I kind of like the chasing down. But I also like the running scared is what I call it. Like I don't catch people when I try and chase them down, turns out. Yeah. I try. <laughs> it just <laughs> doesn't, doesn't happen. happen. Um, I'm like, I'm going to chase them down at the end. And then uh, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, I feel that too. So I would rather be out in front and be able to maintain that lead than have to try to come back from behind. Right. Um, but it was, I also hadn't really looked at the course. So I didn't really know what the elevation anything of it was yeah they had flagging out so i was like following the flagging but it was at mile 10 where i was like i kind of thought i was lost i hadn't seen a flagging in a mile and i was like so i got reception i was able to download the map and that's where i kind of looked and i realized i was like oh i've already done a lot of the climbing there's a couple big climbs left yeah but then i actually i knew what i was getting myself into so i feel like i kind of perked up there at like mile 10 ish um but i also ran out of water there and so the last uh i think it was like seven miles to the first and only aid station on that course Mm -hmm. um but i felt better and i started like running and i was kind of up high now running along the ridge i ran along a couple places that i immediately i was like this is familiar i've done the wasatch front 100 out there twice now and there were some trails i was like i've run this trail during the 100 couldn't tell you like where on it but i was like i've been here like just the different views like so that was kind of neat um and i started it was before coming into that mile 17 aid station i started catching people i passed Mm -hmm three or four people maybe um and that's where i was like okay i'm moving good i'm like not getting copy people and i'm not and now i'm actually catching people um and then when i came into that aid station i found out the two guys that i knew that were running it ahead of me one of them was like five minutes in front five to ten minutes in front of me and i think the other one was like 20 minutes in front of me and i was like these are like big like athletic guys you can and tell their names like, well <laughs> yeah hunter Hunter was one that was like 20 minutes in front of me. And then Kyle, his buddy, who's done a couple Ironmans. Okay. Um, he was only like five to 10 minutes in front of me. And I was like, how am I this close to them? Like that really kind of perked me up where I was like, this is turning into, a, especially passing the people. One guy that I passed was like, how, how was it on guardsman? And I was like, oh, I was walking it. And he said something about like, wow. Like, I think he was a little pissed that I was like moving so well and because I went running past them and they were kind of like, you know, death marching. And that's when I started realizing, I was like, okay, everybody's gone through the exact same thing that I went through. Yep. But I'm still going mm-hmm. and they're all just surviving. Um, so I kind of started moving faster out of there. After that aid station, I knew I only had like two more big climbs. They were very steep, stupid, steep climbs. Um, but then it was a lot of downhill and ended up passing, catching up to Kyle, ran with Kyle for a bit. And then um, I kind of felt bad because his pacer was had he was he had a phone and a map on it, and Kyle said he didn't have his the map, but I didn't realize he also didn't have the phone a phone on him. Mm. So, anyways, um, when I caught up to Kyle, Kyle was like, "I said something about like I'm going to run down this downhill. Like, I'm going to try to stick with you." So we kind of left his pacer behind, and me and him set off. And we did that. The one the pacer was just kind of not able to keep up. Yeah. I think okay. he was a little tired out. And yeah. Um, Respect. <laughs> Tough <laughs> yeah, race. I don't, I don't believe. So, uh, and then, so we finally made it to the top of like this last climb. And it was now like four, three to four miles down into the finish. And Kyle and I had been like, he had actually been like kind of hiking ahead. He has poles and I wasn't using poles. Um, but we made that turn onto the trail and now single track down into the finish. And I took off running and I was like, I knew I could run downhill into the finish just fine. And he was kind of right behind me. 
and then he kind of dropped off and I didn't care to wait for him well apparently he like got off course and was like <laughs> he wasn't happy he was like you left me to the wolves <laughs> he was like I told you I didn't have a phone and I was like oh it, I didn't register that you didn't have a phone like I didn't knew you didn't have a map but but it was also pretty straightforward in March so I was like but also it's and like, it's a race it's so, a race yeah. and you're like how many hours into this at this point yeah, like you can't yeah. be responsible for anybody. I kind of felt bad but yeah I did end up passing him and then because he got lost he finished like a a little bit behind me a ways and i came in right at like 10 minutes behind hunter wow and he came in third overall and i finished fourth overall nice. and that was where i think it was when i came into mile 17 on the run and realized i'd passed up a few more people they were like you're running in like eighth place seventh or eighth place or something and i was like this is like the folks at the aid station yeah, telling you this at that 17 and my crew and, your and crew. The other people's crew and that's where i was like dang like this race is really eating people up yeah and I'm moving up in the field a lot. Anyways. And the back half of that is it's just your around. bread and butter. Yeah. You yeah. know. So that was really neat. And it was really neat even like I was running before I caught Kyle, I think. I was like, I'm in sixth place-ish. And then, because I passed a guy. Um, and then I caught up to Kyle and we passed a guy together. And I told him, I was like, I think we're running in like fifth place. Um, and then when I left Kyle behind, I was thinking I was in fifth place. And I was like, fifth overall? is pretty dang good like, what were you expecting i don't know i when i realized there were only four females signed up i was like i think i can not be last place that's that's hype <laughs> <laughs> Just... i think i cannot be last place um and then i was like the first the top two spots qualify for you for the norseman x try so i was like it'd be cool to try to get first or second that's like the the next one in this race so, series yeah X try, there's like a whole series of them. There's Canada Man, there's Starvation, there's Swede Man, and there's maybe another one. And they're all extreme Ironmans. Yeah. And they're all extreme. Like you can do them as a series, but they qualify you for Norsemen is like the championships. Okay. And so you have to actually, there's 250 lottery spots, and then you can qualify in through these other races. Apparently, I found out like it's Norsemen is considered the toughest triathlon in the world, I guess. Mm. And 5,000 people apply for those 250 open lottery Whoa. spots. So it's like the chances of getting in are very slim. And you have to go win. You have to get top two at one of the other, these other races to get in. Um, so I didn't even like know much about that. But I was like, I want to qualify. So if this. you get top two out of the four females, that would punch your yep. ticket. Yep. Then you're qualified. And you took first. I took first. So yeah. you're going to do this. I am. It's next year in August. Okay. Um, I don't what, where know. Where is it? It's in Norway. Norway? Yep. They take you out like into the middle of a bay and you have to swim the 2.4 miles into the shore. Whoa. Yeah. So you like jump off a boat and go swimming apparently. That's pretty sick. Um, and then is I don't know cold? anything else about the rest of it. I imagine it's cold. Pretty far it's north, in the right? summer. Oh. It's, it's their summer. So, but I imagine it's got to be cold. I don't know if the water ever gets warm up there. Oh, yeah. I'm That's sure it like, never does. Yeah. So well, boots are probably legal. Somewhere up there, right? Yep, yep. Sweden, Norway, Finland. Oh, yeah. That's going to be cold. Yeah. Wow. So I'm doing it next year. Good for you. Yeah. Well, um, what's uh, what's on the map like for this next couple months, August, September? What's next? Um, I'm doing a 50-miler next week. I realized I think the 100-miler was the perfect warm-up for the Ironman, and then I figure 50 miles will be a good cool down. Um, this is actually <laughs> one in Hawaii. And it's like the first year they're doing it. So they kind of like reached out to several people to kind of invite them out. So um, 50 miler, I have they a- They spotted you on like plane tickets? Just the Lodging? Entry. Just the oh, entry. entry. Yeah. okay. And I've worked out the rest. Um, so I'm doing a 50 miler. And then I am doing like basically the several weekends after that will be more functional fitness stuff. Um, I'm doing a functional fitness competition in Texas called Great Games. I'm going to try to get a DecaFit qualifier in. Um, and I am pacing for Leadville, but that's, it's like, if it's not my race, it doesn't really count as an ultra or anything. Um, and then September, I have another like series of ultras. Um, I'm doing a 100K in West Virginia that has a pretty big like cash purse. That's something I've done more this year is kind of put myself into like bigger ultras that have a big prize purse just because like, I'm under no illusion that I can go and win that, but I want to 
try and i want to see how i measure up against the people that are actually competitive competitive enough to win money in these yeah um yeah so i did one earlier in the year in oregon that had a couple thousand dollars for um place the top three places or something um this one this weekend has a cash purse and then this one in west virginia in september um so that one should it's 100k the following weekend, I'm doing a 50 cam doing the Barkley Fall Classic. Oh, sick. I got second the last time I was there, and I would like to win it to get in the Barkley Marathon. So if the first place female and first place male get in? Yep, go to wow. Barkley Marathons. That's kind of cutthroat, first place only. Yeah, yeah. So Barkley Fall Classic, and then I think I have one weekend off, and then I'm doing a 100 miler in Utah slash Idaho. Hmm. So no OCR stuff? Not for September. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then. What about like OCR World Championships? Not doing that? I'm not doing that one this year. No. Um, I'm doing the Spartan Series and the Savage Series. You're so lazy. Yeah. I just like I'm not even trying. Yeah. Uh, the Spartan Series. So October, I have the final race for the Spartan Series, and I'm hoping to win that series. And then the final race for the Savage Series is in November. So October is kind of a lighter month. Um, but then November will be several championship races. And then I'm going to do my first high rocks. Mm. My first high rocks back this year, technically, sort of. I did, yeah. Anyways, that'll be like, I'm going to start building back into high rocks end of November. So, going to focus on that next year a lot? The spring, I plan to. Yeah. Um, but the way it's looking with if I can get into the Barkley Marathons, I'm doing a 200 miler. If I get it, or this Norseman, the summer is definitely going to be an ultra summer. Yeah. Um, but for the spring, definitely going to focus on high rocks. So the plan is to still kind of do both disciplines in your life between like functional fitness racing, like the one hour time domain and then ultras. Yeah. Yeah. I, I still haven't hit a point where one of them, um, I guess I haven't hit a point where one of them is so important that I have to focus just on that and have to like sacrifice everything else. Yeah. Um, I enjoy them and I do well in them and I'm happy with that. Yeah. Like Specializations I, for ants. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I just, I don't know why people are so like anti variety. Honestly, it's, I don't really know it's, either. It's kind of, kind of lame. Yeah. Yeah. And my thing is like, I don't even, when I think about like long term goals, I would like to be the best athlete that I can be, but I don't think that me, the best version of me is being the best at one specific thing. Yeah. I want to be tough to kill and down for anything. And so to continue this variety and I'm trying to progress in both. Um, but I don't have any like need or desire to be like the best at any one thing. Um, I would rather be competitive in a lot of things. Sweet. Well, I think that's a good place to, uh, to uh jump off but uh let people know if they live under a rock don't know who you are uh just like where to find you online yeah um i'm just on instagram mostly at chris Roglowski. Cool. and yeah all over the world all right thanks for coming see you guys later stay wild